The big names continue on the We Are Imps podcast. Over the last three episodes, we've spoken to Matt Reed, Michael Scubala, and Landon Donovan. And now we've got the chairman. He's flown in all the way from South Africa just for this. Okay, maybe a slight exaggeration, but delighted to say that Clive Nates joins us on the podcast. Uh, Clive, lovely to see you. Do those flights back to Lincoln get any easier? Uh, no, they don't, but uh, three flights in seven days, each about 11 hours, uh, Johannesburg to London, London to Phoenix, Phoenix to London, and now I'm freezing Lincoln. But uh, yeah, all good. There is so much that we need to cover on this podcast. So I want to start, Clive, by looking back at, at your time pre-Lincoln City, because you've spoken to so many fans over the years. We know a lot about your time here, but perhaps not your life before joining the club. So tell us exactly how it all started at Peregrine Capital. And if you could, give us a bit of an insight into what type of person it takes to start something like that. Well, let's say life was boring before Lincoln City. Um, so originally an accountant in the investment industry and then with Sean Melnick listing his company on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, he offered me the opportunity to start the first hedge fund management company in South Africa. Uh, so 40 years old, I had the, uh, the decision to make, leave one of the biggest institutions in South Africa and move to you know a completely new business, never been tried in South Africa. And yeah, went for it uh, and I think that's well there's without a doubt that's the only reason I ha had the opportunity to take a stake in Lincoln City uh, without the opportunity at Peregrine Capital uh, Lincoln City would never have happened um, yeah it was I always loved the stock market it was a hobby it became uh, my job and uh, yeah, spent a uh, number of successful years there. Uh, retired quite early from that and traded ec traded global equity markets for a while. When my youngest kid was finished school, I decided, well, it's going to be a bit boring at home on my own with my wife doing a lot of traveling as well and decided either go back into hedge, the hedge fund business or do something crazy like getting involved with an English football team, which was always, let's say, the number one item on my bucket list. You've almost answered the next question there for me as well, which was, was it always in your thinking, always something that you wanted to do to to play a major part in joining a football club? And tell us a little bit about that. I think I always wanted to be involved with f f football in, in some form. Uh, my two great hobbies were football and the stock market. I had the chance, you know, to, to work uh, in the investment industry. And yeah, uh, it took me a while to work out, well, how could I get into the football industry? And uh, suddenly clicked, well, you know, why not take a stake in an English football club? I mean, obviously, as you know, Everton is the team I've supported since uh, I was a kid. Uh, I loved looking at the whole English football pyramid followed you know a number of other teams for various reasons and Lincoln City I started to follow on the back of the alliance that they had with Everton in 2002 you know, it was days really pre uh, knowing everything that you could see on the internet so I didn't really know that nothing uh, major came out of that alliance but I just followed Lincoln City and always back the underdogs so when they fell into non-league I probably looked at them you know even a bit more uh, I made this confession I even played Lincoln City as football manager uh, trying to get them out of non-league so yeah I was well prepared for this and were you successful in football manager and getting us out of the football league uh, not really um, it just took up so much time uh, you know hated some of the flaws in the game. So, yeah, played it a bit, but, uh, yeah, never quite as much as I hear guys 
that uh, I meet at various games and they tell me they've got Lincoln City into the Champions League. But thankfully, you did it in real life, and that's what really counts. Well, I don't know about the Champions League yet. <laughs> Very good point. Give it time. Give it time. So you joined the club in February 2016, and then three months or so later, the Cowleys are hired. Was it always Danny and Nicky Cowley that you wanted? Of course, there were other candidates, but could you just take us through the process of that? It seems like such a long time ago now, doesn't it? But when you do look back, were they the number one straight from the off? Yeah, so I think it was some time in early 2016, I read an article on Southampton, how they scouted uh, managers before they needed uh, a manager. And I thought, well, this is just, you know, makes absolute sense. What, you know, who would we take if we needed a manager at some point? So I started to look into it. And, you know, came up with a number of articles about uh, Danny and Nicky and, you know, continue to read about them. Um, and, yeah, they looked like the perfect fit for us. And I remember bringing it up one Friday evening. We were in the strugglers, as we tended to be on a Friday evening. And I mentioned it to Bob and a couple of his friends there. And... I suppose the immediate reaction was, oh, the Essex connection, you know, and what had happened with Tolson beforehand. And, uh, yeah, didn't think too much of it. And then, obviously, when Chris stood down and we had to start look, start looking for a new manager, uh, I remember getting a call from Bob one evening. He said, you won't believe it. Danny's got, a, got a hold of us and he's interested in the job. I mean, what an incredible season. And we could spend a whole podcast just talking about it. Ultimately, we, the fans, we know exactly what happened. But I just, from your perspective, what was that year like? Because I imagine you had to make a few more trips back to Lincoln than you probably foresaw that you would have had to have made at the time. Personally, did you expect things to take off in quite the way they did? And did it almost um, throw your life into a bit of chaos for that year or so? I don't know about chaos. I mean, it was just an absolutely, you know, incredible period. Um, yeah, one of the surprise trips or unplanned trips, let's say, was getting over for the Ipswich Town replay. And yeah, it. We've had a couple of good games since then, but it's hard to surpass, you know, that evening and just the excitement uh, of that goal. How time almost stood still as Nathan went around their keeper and put the ball in the back of the net and I just remember thinking we're going to win this and then the ball hit the net yeah and everybody just erupted. So let's just go through that season a little bit then Clive um, and again I mentioned it before but there's so much that we could talk about when you look back at it which moments stand out to you which decisions that, that you made that Bob made, that anyone else at the club at the time you think made, played such a key role in all the success that followed? Yeah, I mean, you wouldn't have known it at the time the decision was made, but the signing of Sean Raggett, especially with that goal against Burnley, and that just changed everything for Lincoln City. Um, so Sean was totally unplanned. Um, it was actually local election day, and if I remember right, it was the 3rd of August, uh, 2016, and I'd been helping out a political party, uh, being an observer, and my shift was 6 to 11, and something went wrong during that session, and I, there was a little bit of time out, so I quickly ran to have a look at my phone, and the whole lot of missed calls from Danny, and uh, well, all I wanted was my session to end so I could get a call out to him and find out what was going on. Hop in the car, speak to Danny, and he says, we, get the, we got this chance of signing Sean Raggett. Uh, he's on his way to Barrow, but, you know, he's going to pop in to see us. And, you know, we start talking about uh, what it would entail. 
Um, there's no chance of doing a deal with Dover. They won't, won't accept anything less than 100K. Obviously, our valuation is a lot less than that. So it's about taking a risk of going to an FA tribunal um, if we go ahead with the deal. And obviously, we spend some time to think about this. Sean gets up to Sinselbank. Everything's sort of agreed on the personal details. And then we've got to decide, well, are we going to take a risk on potentially paying up to 100K? So we eventually take the decision, okay, if it comes to that, I'll, I'll meet that liability. And we bring Sean in. As it turned out, because of the FA Cup run, I didn't need to put any additional money in. The club had already made sufficient money to pay the fee that uh, the tribunal awarded. But yeah, that goal from Sean, you know, it was 250k in prize money for winning that 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 round, 250k for uh, broadcasting for the quarterfinal. But what swung it was the share of the gate uh, uh, playing Arsenal that day. And without that, I'm not sure we would have had the ability to build the EPC, provide the additional funding, you know, to help whatever the investors were putting in, in League Two. So without a doubt, that was the big game changer. And with that in mind, it, it is amazing, isn't it, how much an FA Cup run can change the the course of a club's history going forward. So when you hear managers, um, and I guess I'll have to use Thomas Frank at Brentford as the most recent manager that's spoken out against this. When you hear managers discussing the idea that that replays, okay, we actually didn't need a replay with Burnley to do what we did, ironically, but when you hear Premier League managers talking about the lack of a need of a replay, what goes through your head at that point? Yeah, I think it lessens the excitement of the, of the FA Cup. I mean, we didn't need a replay against Burnley, but like I said before, the game against Ipswich, that replay is just, I think, it's hard to surpass, you know, the, the feelings of excitement that you felt after winning that game. And who knows, uh, you know, if that game at Portman Road had gone to out of time or penalties, Maybe that would have been the end of our FA Cup run. Clive, you've often had to make big decisions at this club, whether that was redundancies here at the club or players not been offered new contracts or even managers losing their jobs. But is that just part of the territory and how have you learned to deal with that aspect of the role? Yeah, look, I think, you know, being involved in the investment industry, you just make decisions all day, every day. Obviously, there are some very, very important decisions you make. Um, I think I'm just used to making decisions. Um, some are obviously more difficult to make, but uh, I think you just do it. comes it. with the territory. Yeah, it's yeah, part of the job, yeah, I guess. Yeah. No, without a doubt. Right, let's fast forward to 2017-18 then. Um, we lose against Exeter in the playoffs, but we win the Checker Trade Trophy at Wembley. Firstly, we'll look at Exeter and the disappointment that came with that. When I look back at it, I wasn't at Exeter away, but when I look back at it, it was particularly the pitch invasion um, that is one of the images that stands out. What are your memories of that season? Yeah, without a doubt, the highlight uh, is the Checker Trade Trophy win. Uh, yeah, just an incredible day. 27,000 plus Lincoln City fans at Wembley, our first visit to Wembley. Um, yeah, that's the, that's the highlight, as I said. Um, you know, I think even to finish in the playoffs was an achievement that year. Um, I think we had a few injuries at the time, um, especially at left back, if I remember. So, yeah, I think we were always on the back foot going to, to Exeter. Um, obviously, it wasn't an enjoyable trip down there. And then the Exeter City fans on the field at the end, you know, sort of uh, 
giving it to the Lakers City fans. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it wasn't great, but I think you've got to have uh, bad days like that to set you up for what happened the following season. And we'll come on to that shortly. I guess when you look at 27,000 fans at Wembley, is that one of those moments where you just have to take it in? And not a case of, look what I've built, but there must be that element to you when you're sitting, I'm presuming you were sitting in, in the director's box at the time at, at Wembley during that no, game. Were you over no, for I was it? with the fans. You were with the fans. You yeah, were with the fans. I saw you there. I'm remember? Sorry. You don't even remember. I was busy working, Clive. I was, <laughs> I, was, I was busy filming a documentary for this club. I was working. I was in focus mode. <laughs> okay, you were in with the fans. But when you look around and you see 27,000 Lincoln City fans there, what's, what's the feeling? Yeah, to think that we as, you know, as a club that had really only been involved with for two years and already achieved what we had in the previous season and now won a trophy at Wembley. Yeah, it's just, just an amazing day. You talked there before about you need the difficult times to, to enjoy the better times. I mean, we've been lucky really over the past five, six, seven, eight years that there have been so many more better times than there have been difficult ones when you when something like Exeter happens is that further fuel does everyone come together at the club and go right we're going to use this to to move forward and to take this club to where we think it belongs I don't know if it was used quite that way but you know certainly I remember talking to Danny and Nikki and looking at uh, what we needed to improve um, you know after our first season in League Two and clearly, the difference between us and the teams that finished in the top three was our, our waveform. It wasn't good enough to get automatic promotion. And that was the focus of Danny and Nicky for the next season. I think John Akindi was part of that. And if I remember correctly, I think our waveform in the League Two promotion season was better than a home form. So John Akinde gets signed and we'll come on to transfer dealings perhaps a little bit later on in the podcast. But what is the process when looking at a player like John? Is it you yourself that will look at maybe Y Scout as a as a stats website or something like that? Do you liaise with the head of football back here? How does a signing like John Akinde take place? All right, well you know, in those days, we didn't have a director of football as such. So Danny and Nicky would have led the whole recruitment process. So it would have been a case of, uh, you know, bringing him to our attention, the, let's say the football exco committee, and then, you know, trying to do a deal uh, with John, both on a personal basis and negotiating a transfer fee with uh, Barnett in that case. So as it turned out, I think I had become chairman a couple of months before that. And most of the negotiations, even to this day, are all done, director of football, to whoever the counterpart is, or even if it's a chairman at the other club, but on three occasions, um, the chairman at the other club has insisted that it had to be chairman to chairman. And that was the first occasion that it happened for me. The chairman of Barnett would only deal with me. And there I had to go into a negotiation with uh, Tony at Barnett. Um, and this was a player that Danny desperately wanted um, and yeah obviously under those circumstances uh, you know I think Bonner got the better part of the deal I mean there's there's a, there's a little bit to unpack there firstly how difficult is it when you know that you've got a manager that really really wants a player and do you feel that pressure almost from him and I don't necessarily mean Danny specifically but in this case we'll use Danny as the example you know that you're going into there to try and make him happy even though you're the one that oversees the club you're you've been sort of guided by someone who says this is exactly who I want that can help get us the promotion at that point what are you feeling yeah there was a lot of pressure 
because there didn't seem to be uh, an option B. Um, I think what made it more difficult to convince the Barnard chairman to take anything less is John had nearly moved to Birmingham City for around about a million pounds, I think it was the season before. So that was in the Barnard chairman's mind. And to get him down to even what we did ultimately pay for him was a big climb down for him. Chairman to chairman. So that was, is that the only time that that has happened in your tenure? Obviously it was the first time, but that hasn't happened since. No, it's happened two other times. Okay, two other times. Are we allowed to go, are we allowed to discuss? I'm trying to give, <laughs> trying to give fans an insight. It's difficult, isn't it? Because obviously you've got legalities to, to bear in mind firstly. And of course you've got, a, I guess, a, a moral code not to... Um, disclose information that happens behind closed doors. But still, it is so interesting to hear what goes on behind those doors and, and those transfers that that take place. Because for us at home, we just assume sometimes, no matter how much we watch football, we just assume that the deal is done, ring up, call, there we go, the contract is signed. Obviously, it's not quite that simple. Um, do we get to give a bit of an insight into the other two occasions? Yeah. Um... The second one was done on a tennis court. I was playing a game of tennis and the chairman, this was going up and down with the opposing chairman. And eventually we agreed a deal. It was to get an employee out of Grimsby. And then the final one was done in the car park of a veterinary hospital where I agreed with uh, the South End chairman to do a deal for Tom Hopper. Okay. First question, was the animal okay? Yeah, well, she's fine, yeah. I went and got a dog from a, a shelter that had been badly attacked by other dogs. So I had two weeks of uh, taking this poor dog in every day to the veterinary hospital. And yes, this is where Tom Hopper was ultimately signed. I wonder, does Tom Hopper know that? No, he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Um, for you, you mentioned football manager before and obviously now Jez George has come into the club and we'll come on to the way, the model, the process, whatever term we want to use. But there was a time where you were the one, I'm presuming, that decided who to sign and how to sign players. Am I right in saying that I'm looking back at sort of 16, 16, 17, 17, 18, was it you yourself that would sit there and go through stats and everything like that and, and make the call to the player? Because there wasn't the amount of staff to be able to do that, was there, to, to actually outsource that as a role? No, D Danny and Nicky would have done yeah. that. Uh, yeah, they would have been the ones that- Sorry, I meant with Dan. yeah, with Danny yeah. and Nicky. You would do that as a, maybe as a three. Um, no, I mean, the f football executive committee was involved. You know, I might have, like in the instances with dealing chairman to chairman, would have had more involvement because that was determined by the other club. But otherwise, as a committee, whoever was on that committee, Roger Bates at the time, uh, Bob certainly in those initial days when he was chairman. So we would have all had equal involvement in finally signing off on any of those deals. How difficult is it to uh, deal with a situation when you've not got the player that you want to sign? We mentioned about signing John Akinde there, Tom Hopper there, successful transfer deals. But there are moments, I'm sure, and moments that we as fans probably don't know about players that we've maybe missed out on at the time. For you, how much of a disappointment can that be when you don't, get the player that you have focused on for so long. Yeah. No, it's a big disappointment. And, you know, it was even a bigger disappointment for, let's say, the likes of Danny and Nicky. There was a striker we were once expecting to sign. He flew into an airport nearby. And instead of coming to Central Bank, he went to Mansfield. Um, we had another player that came and did a, a medical. Everything agreed. And suddenly he decided not to sign joined another team in our league and turned out to be a bit of a disaster. So you look at that and you think, okay, well, you know, sometimes it turns out actually well that he didn't sign. And you never bumped into Dwight York or Michael Bridges at the Bentley Hotel, no? No. no. You've heard that one before, haven't you? obviously have on social media, <laughs> yeah. 
I remember getting my hopes up many a time reading uh, the various forums back in the day about those two. Um, Simeon Akinola, we saw you with with Simeon uh, a few weeks ago by the time that this podcast goes out as well. Are you able to to, to give a bit of an insight into quite what happened there? Because that was another uh, transfer situation that brings about its own story, as so many of them do. Yeah, obviously he was the player that Danny and Nicky knew well, wanted to bring him in. Um, yeah, and there were complications with getting that deal across the line. Barnett were involved in bringing in another striker until they finished that deal. They didn't want to sign off on Sims deal and it didn't go through. Um, obviously Liam, you know, had interacted with Sim here. You know, I'd never met him, but connected on uh, Twitter, uh, messaged him and, you know, said how sorry it, uh, we were that it didn't go through. And it basically started a connection. We kept in touch with it. It was, you know, wishing each other happy birthday or saying, well done on this or that. Uh, you know, his, his father passed away, so offer condolences there. And then, you know, he would got a degree from university before he started to play football. Um, obviously knew mom background and he was looking at getting into the financial services industry and just asked for some advice on that and you know was happy to meet up at times and give him advice on that. And uh, yeah, he's now got a full-time job at JP Morgan. And uh, in coming over to London, he had messaged me a couple of weeks before and said, let's meet up. And I said, well, how about coming to a game at uh, Sinsel Bank? And yeah, came up with me uh, by train from London and was here for the Peterborough game. Right, we've gone off track a little bit, Clive. So we're going to bring it back to 18-19, winning League Two. The memories for you at that point, when I look back, it's a picture of you sitting in the away end with 5,000 MK Dons fans at the time. Why is it so important to you to often sit in with the fans at matches? I think firstly, I'm just a football fan. Um, I wanted to be involved in football. Um, so I think it's strange to watch football, say, dressed up in a suit. Um, I think it's also crazy when you go to an away ground, not, not only do you have to dress up, but you sit with the other fans. So when, when you score, when you celebrate, I don't know, it's not the same. I never felt it was the same on the few occasions that I did that. Um, yeah, for me, it's the only place to sit. What is your relationship like with other chairman, chief executives, owners of clubs in the FL? We talked a little bit about the Barnet chairman before. Um, some names that come to mind, I guess, Andy Holt, Darren McAntony. Big characters, obviously, at one point, we were in the same division as Salford as well. That season, we were in the same division as Salford. So plenty of interesting conversations that no doubt take place. I'm just trying to picture, is there a, is there a WhatsApp group or anything like that? Is, that? is it as simple as that? Or do you actually not really have much to do with them? Look, uh, the fact that I'm only over for a couple of games, the only time I would really have a chance to meet an opposing Chairman would be at a home game because, as we've discussed, away games, I'm generally not in the boardrooms. Um, so, yeah, there are a few I might have developed a relationship with, but not many. Um, also, there would be the odd EFL meeting, but again, I'm not over necessarily for, the, for those physical meetings. It would just be, especially in the COVID times, when there were Zoom meetings, but you can't build up a relationship over Zoom. So, yeah, I would say it's pretty limited at this stage. And if we look at when Danny and Nicky left, how inevitable was it for you that they would eventually move on to a club in a higher division? Because at the time, I believe they were linked with West Bromwich Albion, weren't they? That nearly 
came to fruition but didn't or maybe you're looking at me strangely so maybe that was literally just a rumor that i got carried away with <laughs> um yeah never believe what you read <laughs> <laughs> i'll blame the stacy west blog for that sorry gary um no i'm probably wrong there as well uh of course they go to huddersfield but at the time were you prepared for them leaving for a bigger club look there was certainly a, a lot of rumors around that time um Sheffield Wednesday was one. Um, so I think there was always that risk that, uh, you know, they might go off. And uh, I think we had sort of, you know, in the background, been planning for that, as we always do, as we continue to be, continue to look at who might come in if we lose our current manager. Um, yeah, it was... It was a difficult period because obviously with the success that Danny and Nicky had achieved in such a short period, I mean, I didn't work much with Chris. So they were the, oh, the only management team I really knew and it just seemed, whoa, if Danny and Nicky leave, what's it going to be like? Um, so yeah, I think it was, you know, quite emotional when I spoke to Danny that Sunday evening and he said they had agreed to move to Huddersfield um, but yeah you know fair play to them we were well compensated f uh, for, for them moving on and ultimately they went and signed uh, Harry Toffolo which uh, as you've seen in our latest annual report is our record sale were there other times where there were conversations that you had with Danny and Nikki where you were either able or even felt the need to persuade them to stay? Because obviously by the sounds of what you're saying there, the, the decision was made. They called you up or, or Danny called you up and said, we're leaving. Were there moments where you said, no, look, come on, we can still win things at this club? Or, or, was, or were those conversations never had? No, they did suggest that there were things that we could do that would keep them uh, at Sunset Bank. Um, I think it's a time when I'm happy that I'm not, like so many owners, the only person in charge um, because if I'd been on my own, it's not impossible. I would have done re something really stupid and bent over backwards to have kept them. But when you've got a board of directors, when we work in the way we do in a collaborative environment, um, I think we had already extended ourselves too far financially. And if we try to do anything further, I think the club could have got into trouble. But yeah, it's just good to have other voices around to say, there's, there's just no way you can go there. And the board was absolutely unanimous on the decision that, you know, we couldn't go any further than we had. And is that a point where you, as the board, take a feel like you're taking a gamble into the unknown doing that? Had you accounted that you might have to make a decision like that? Or is it a case of, no, we have to stick by our guns on this one? It will work out eventually life moves on yeah um i don't even think it was so much looking to what the future would bring it was we couldn't go where maybe danny and nikki wanted us to go we just didn't have the resources i think clive i've lost track of time here if i'm being honest with you um i do normally have a timer but Technology is getting the better of me today. My suggestion would be that we take this into a part two because I think we've rounded things off nicely with the, the Danny and Nikki Cowley era, whatever you want to call it. You've covered some really brilliant, insightful things for us so far, but there's so much more to get through. So if you don't mind, we'll take this into a part two. Is that all right? Yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs>